Okay, we are here today with the caretaker, senator of the Kalinago Territory, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Annette Sanford, um, considered a gem of the Kalinago Territory. And we are actually right now standing in the Barana Ute, um, which means village by the sea. And this is like a major attraction in Dominica in the territory. Um, Annette, thanks for taking the time out. Uh, we'd first like to begin um, by just asking you, I mean, the culture of the Kalinago people. We see that over the years and in different countries, um, culture is something that can be invaded upon by other cultures or by migration. But in Dominica, we see the Kalinago culture is somehow kept reserved, for lack of a better word. And which is a good thing, but in your words, um, you living here, seeing your people, working with your people, has the Kalina Kalinago culture been kept alive? Good afternoon, and um, thank you for the opportunity. I do believe that the Kalinago culture has been kept alive. I mean, um, we have survived the brutality of the Europeans and the acts that they committed, even through assimilation. And look at us now, 500 years later, Many of us are still practicing our traditional um, rules in the community. We engage in our dances. There are many people who still do the dresses, our cooking, our agricultural practices. And right now we are trying very hard to revive our language. So, of course, we have done quite a bit of work in helping to preserve our culture. And it still is very much alive here in the Kalinago territory. Um, moving into the discussion of um, climate change, uh, climate justice, and how climatic disasters um, have affected uh, the Caribbean countries over the years, but specifically to the Kalinago territory and our Kalinago farmers. I mean, they didn't bring, you know, for example, Hurricane Maria on themselves, and yet they had to go through the economic fallout, um, losing all their crops. Um, losing that kind of investment. So, um, in, in terms of that, I mean, what's the approach now? Um, do you see a, a shift or a change in, um, you know, uh, the way we do agriculture in Kalinago territory? I mean, are we moving into a more resilient uh, type of, of process in, in doing that? Farming, that is. Well, um, based on what's happening within the Kalinago territory, there have been a lot of discussions as to how we can move forward. But as to doing the actual work or getting it done, I haven't seen much of that. Um, we have a lot of plans, we have a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas, but these things have not really materialized. If you look at the agricultural sector and the production in agriculture over the last 10 years, we see that the revenues that we receive from agriculture has consistently declined. I mean, we moved from 180 million in revenues to now having about 30 million in, in revenues from agricultural exports. So that in itself says a lot about how we are doing with agriculture in the Kalinago territory, the Kalinago space. Um, so the Kalinago farmers have their challenges. We have a lot of challenges that we need to deal with. And one of the major ones, of course, is through our markets. Our farmers are complaining of the markets, but for me also we see all the challenges as having packing sheds for our farmers, um, having them to be able to process their foods to add more value to it. Um, these things are lacking in the community. So, um, like I said, there's a lot of talk, but very little action in getting these plans and ideas executed. My follow-up question um, in relation to climate justice, who is to blame? Um, we're seeing that in the Caribbean uh, and the Prime Minister uh, and the opposition leaders as well, both the Freedom and the UWP in Dominica, have agreed that we are not really the main causes for climate change and yet we are the ones receiving the brunt. Um, all these major storms and, and massive destruction, the erosion of our, our shorelines and all of that, who do we blame? Where's the climate justice? Your point of view. Um, there are many factors that affect 
climate climate change and climate resilience and, and how we approach it. Like you said, like you mentioned, um, natural disasters, we have absolutely no control over it. Um, but there are measures that we can do to prevent it. Um, I, I separate it into two different categories. You have the, the man-made disasters, which would of course include how we, the individuals, take care of our environment around us. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of cutting of trees, um, practices in farming that put the, the whole landscape at risk. Yeah. Um, we can look at that. But also, we look at the leadership and what they're doing in order to make agriculture a more productive sector in Dominica. Um, so, so these are the two major factors, I would think, the natural disasters and our leadership. If we look at our agricultural ministers over the last 10 years, they, I would say they're very incompetent. They haven't done much to really bring back agriculture. There's been a loss of focus into tourism and um, food security. If we're talking about food security right now in the advent of COVID-19, um, we haven't done very well in that. I think we should have used the opportunity to have maximized on the whole pandemic to secure Dominica as a food haven for the Caribbean, and we haven't been able to do that. So I, I would blame our leaders for not taking a, a more proactive approach to agriculture in Dominica current, and as a matter of fact, it affects the entire country. We see the Kalinago farmers um, taking a more uh, focused approach in crops that they farm, a lot of focus on root, cr um, root crop farming. Um, this is also encouraged uh, by the current government. What's your view on that? Um, is that the way to go in terms of building supply right now? Um, for me, I think that any food that is produced in any country at this time is, is needed. Um, so therefore, it contributes to food security, whether it be root crop or tree crops. Um, so I would encourage anyone to engage in whatever form of farming that they can, especially given the type of landscape they may have their lands on. Yeah. So farmers who have um, lands that could accommodate the root crops, go for it. And those who don't, then they can do the other types of um, produce. Um, but um, for us in the Kalinago territory, we do not engage a lot in the root crops. So we will more see our farmers doing the plantains and this kind of the tree crops, the fruits, and so on. Um, primarily because most of the root crops too that they tend to grow, it takes a long time. For example, the tanias, they will take a long time to get harvested, like nine months, and it takes a lot of work to maintain these crops. And the cost of fertilizer, and the cost of agricultural materials to maintain those crops is very, very costly for these farmers. And so it discourages them to, you know, um, invest in those long and long-term crops as opposed to doing something short-term. Maybe like the cucumbers, you get in the three months time you sell and that's it. So you wouldn't have to spend so much on fertilizer and those things. Yeah. So, yeah, I think root crops helps. Um, tree crops, whatever you have, whatever crop you have, it will help in maintaining food security within any country and um, if that's what you can do then go for it. Specifically in the context of climate change though, um, is root crop cultivation helping Dominica's fiscal incentive? Um, it depends on the type and the type. Yeah. So um, people may not consider for example vetiver to be so much of a crop, right? But it, it helps the terrain. You, some a lot of our farmers do a lot of vetiver planting because they use it to export to do perfumes and those things. Mm -hmm. And then they also use it to do their crafts. But if you're talking about the other um, crops, then I would say no because because of the, the type of terrain that we have here, especially in the Kalinago territory, um, prone to landslides and all of that. It it really doesn't help us. It, it really doesn't help us here on this side of the island. Um, in, in terms of the farming community, um, what's your view on organization? Uh, are the Kalinago farmers organized uh, to uh, maybe raise their concerns or provide even recommendations to the authorities who assist them from time to time? 
The Kalinago territory is not very organized that way to voice their concerns. Um, and I don't think that the leadership of the community have made it any easier for them. So, um, for example, we have a parliamentary representative, but then we hardly have any consultations with the community. Um, most of the time it's either now and then on the radio you pass a little news or um, via social media you put a post up, but not everybody have access to the internet and not everybody listens to the radio. So as to having community meetings, that's lacking a lot. And even our Kalinago Council, we have had absolutely no form of consultation with the Kalinago Council and the chief from the time that they were elected. So it makes it very difficult for people to find uh, an avenue to voice their concerns and to reach out. And farmers generally are not really heard. So for me, most of them tend to depend on the opposition or the, myself. When I go to parliament, I would visit them, I would do house to house and try to find ways in which I listen to them and then I take it up to a higher level. Or sometimes I will you know, talk to the pal rep or talk to the chief if I can um, deal with them for that particular situation. I would speak directly to the chief, speak directly to the parliamentary representative and let them know that these farmers are having these concerns before going to parliament with it. And if, so like sometimes, <laughs> I tend to get um, these blocks because of being on the opposition side and I see that my voice is not being heard through them or they're not listening to what I'm saying, then I would definitely take it up to Parliament where it's discussed at a wider level. Yeah. Okay, so um, in terms of, uh, I guess, the future of, of farming in the Kalinago Territory, um, what recommendations or maybe initiatives um, can you tell us maybe you, you have embarked on with some of the farmers here if, you, if you'd like to go into that? What can you tell us? So, like I mentioned before, one of the major problems that we've been having in the territory is access to markets for the mm. produce. And um, we, we have seen like farmers have thousands of plantains going to waste at one time, sometimes the cucumbers, whatever they grow, and they get very discouraged. Yeah. For me, what I have done is I've tried to source um, someone who would be able to buy from the farmers. And even if I'm trying, it's, it, the lim limited amount that we can take is so small that not everybody can benefit at any one time. But it does help. So we arranged this agriculture um, export with um, Mr. Schillingford. And um, he's able to buy our produce, our planting, some of our root crops, and um, avocados and these kinds of things. And we transport it to Portsmouth where he then export it to countries like Antigua and Guadeloupe and St. Lucia. Yeah. So this has helped a bit. But um, otherwise, um, we've, not had very, we've not had a lot of help with um, the agricultural sector here in the territory. And the farmers are getting very, very discouraged. Um, farmers are saying, I'm not going to, into farming as I used to before. I'm cutting down what I'm planting. But then I try to encourage them because right now we need to engage in more agriculture just for food security purposes, mm -hmm. even what is happening around the world globally. Um, the cost of food is rising well, in Dominica and um, our food import bill is sky high. So we have to find ways to encourage our people to invest more into agriculture. Um, we've also been looking at, of course, like I mentioned, the packing sheds for the farmers. So if we have a, a, a supply chain that is organized, I remember in the time when we had the bananas, we had a very organized supply chain. So if the farmers would come to the packing shed, bring the produce from there, they would take it to somewhere else, to the boat, you know, it was very, very organized. So the, the farmers, for agriculture to work, we need some system like that, that we had before. Mm -hmm. um, so the agricultural center that have been, um, we've been speaking for for a long time, and that was one of the promises that the government made that they were going to build an agricultural center here. This has not materialized. It's almost 15 years now. Um, but I believe that if we do have the center, it will definitely benefit the Kalinago territory and the people and the farmers. Also, we're looking at agro-processing units within the Kalinago territory or even around Dominica, where people would be able to process their fruits, 
process even they're planting to do things like flower you know what I mean something different so that we wouldn't have to be exporting so much from the other countries so mm -hmm. these are the things that I'm looking at um, and I'm hoping that if I get to any position or um, to be able to make these things happen then these are the avenues and these are the things that I would do fantastic um, talking to the farmers um, in, in coming to the, the idea of um, organization and structure um, they informed me that unity is lacking uh, among their community among the farming community um, do you see that changing uh, you know soon in the future it's it's very difficult to see I would I would to me personally I would say it would depend on the leadership of the community because the current leadership we have now um, encourages that kind of division among the people I say that because we see a lot of victimization we see a lot of people who did not support the government they will be um, they will be victimized they wouldn't be given certain inputs so they wouldn't be given certain and that, that's happening in current day it's happening of course in culinary territory with the housing program even with the agriculture um, inputs that they were given recently it has been happening for a while now and um, many people are starting to get to speak about it because they realize that if you have issues you have to talk you have to find ways to speak and so they're becoming stronger but it's going to be a long time if the current leadership remains in office then the division is going to continue because people will be given certain incentives because they support a certain government or you will be given certain things because they want your vote and that's not how it's supposed to be i, I see a leader as someone who is there for the people so it doesn't matter who you support whether you supported the opposition or the um current government then you are their leader so whatever needs that they have you would have to attend to it but that's just me but um, the other side doesn't see it that way and that makes it difficult for unity in the community okay so what are the effects or I should say um, creed we know it was developed for purposes of advancing all aspects of Dominican people as far as uh, resilience to climatic disasters are concerned and the economy, um, ecotourism, eco, well, agriculture initiatives and all of that was supposed to be under that portfolio of Creed. Um, in terms of the Kalinago territory, what has Creed done for the Kalinago people? The Kalinago territory have not benefited very much from the Creed initiative in Dominica. Um, if we look at their objective, it's really to build stronger communities and of course, like they said, to accelerate the economy, to build a stronger economy. And when you look at the Kalinago territory, we are still basically um, almost the same place we are at. So, for example, we look at the natural disaster. Where do we go if there's a major disaster in the Kalinago territory? What, what is happening to our um, disaster shelters? You know, the infrastructure has not been upgraded. I mean, we can safely say perhaps we can go to Castle Bruce, but Castle Bruce is a distance off, and we do have our shelters here in the territory, but it's like the schools, community centers that need to be upgraded, and this has not been happening. And we also look at the community on a whole. You look at um, a safe space for our young people, Nothing is happening. A lot of our young people on drugs, a lot of people on um, alcohol. We wow. look at our healthcare system, uh, totally neglected. Our health facility, whenever the nurse goes on vacation, stays locked, especially Salivia, with no healthcare for the people for months or whenever the nurse comes back. They would either have to travel all the way to Casa Bruce or go to Wesley, you know, to get healthcare. And um, healthcare is a basic human right. So when, when you speak of resilience, this, these are all intertwined. You cannot neglect agriculture, you cannot neglect um, your youth, you cannot neglect um, health care. Uh, and of course, we mentioned the economy. The economy in the Kalinago territory is, has plummeted for the past 20 or so years. 
people are struggling. We have to depend on the government for basically almost everything. We have to depend on them for housing, paying your hospital fees. Um, if you have any bills or sunny bills, we have to depend on the government. And that is not a resilient community. I see a resilient community as people who could fend for themselves, people who have um, been engaging in a lot of sustainable practices and we are lacking in these areas. Um, in terms of renewable energy, um, are there any plans for that? Have you heard any plans for um, accessing that um, either through uh, you know, cultivation initiatives or farming initiatives where farmers would be given certain inputs that would provide energy to their farms in a renewable fashion? Um, have these discussions come up? Um, some years ago, um, there were there were a lot of discussion on solar, solar energy used in the Kalinago territory. But with solar itself, you also have to look at the legal implications of having it within the community. You would have uh, our legal system in Dominica um, allows Domlek to have total control over energy electrical energy and therefore if you need a community to have solar energy of course you would have to change your laws to have people have their personal solar um, farmers on their farms or wherever they, they want to whether it be in their homes and um, this has not materialized we had some solar um, equipments come to Dominica about maybe about six or seven years ago when the Honorable Cassius Daru was the parliamentary representative, but um, this never came through because they did not discuss with Domlek about the, the the possibility of buying this electricity from Domlek or Domlek buying from them rather. So that caused some conflict, and yeah. as a as a result, the, the solar energy well, most of the equipments were stolen, and um, we lost a lot of that investment. So the discussion on other forms have not really been um, on the forefront. I'm hearing a lot about geothermal energy from a national point of view, yeah. but for me, I would I would consider hydro um, hydro powered forms of energy in Dominica currently. We have at least 30 percent of our electricity being powered through hydroelectricity in Dominica. If we have a few more hydro plants, then of course nationally we'll have a reduction in energy and then the cost of electricity will automatically decrease for everybody, including the Kalinago territory. So I think that would be a more um, practical solution for us. But I'm not sure if the government will take that up anytime soon. But as for other forms of energy within the territory, um, no, we have not had any discussions on renewable forms of energy for the farmers or persons in the community.